Uh, th thanks very much indeed for being here because um, you know, it's, we very much appreciate it. Uh, we know that this kind of subject is not the easiest one to think about. So I think you should you know, all give yourselves a, a pat on the back from us for, for actually coming here and, and being prepared to think about it. And it's, it's important to us as a family that, that uh, experience. It's also very important to the families that are in Fukushima and, and Japan to know that people are aware of what's happening. That's very important, both emotionally and politically, in terms of changing what the Japanese government's doing. So, uh, you know, thank you very much again. OK. Um, just um, as it happened over two years ago, and you're probably familiar with um, the event itself um, of the length of March 2011, um, we're probably not going to talk too much about the, what actually happened at the plant because that was in the news. Oh. So we're going to begin by bringing it right up to date because it's not a historical event. It's something that's an ongoing, unfolding event that is going to be having an impact on people's lives for many years to come. So we're going to start off by telling you roughly what's happening in Japan now. Um, and I suppose one of the, as, as this exhibition is uh, portraits of children who were living with the consequences who were in Fukushima at the time, these are the actual faces um, of children. Um, when we're talking about this issue, it's both it involves statistics and politics, but it's played out in children's bodies and children's lives as they grow up. Um, so I think we'll start off by thinking about the impact on, on children. Um, so this project is, uh, involves collaborative portraits of children, um, each of whom was living in, some of them very close to the plant at the time, within the compulsory evacuation zone. Some of them a little further away, but all of them affected. And it, you can see that each of them is an individual person with their own life, just as in your family, everybody is an individual. And as soon as you start thinking about actual individual people, it takes on a completely different flavour. And, and that's really the reality when you, if you live somewhere, that's what you're thinking about most is your, your own family and your children. So what's happening to those children now? And perhaps, Mitsuko, you could talk about the, the, of the children that have been tested. Many of the, the children have been tested now for thyroid issues. Perhaps you could uh, just tell us a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, just uh, the government, uh, it's not actually the government, uh, the Fukushima Prefecture, um, check the children thyroid test, but uh, not all of them yet. And for example, like that is la until uh, that is until last summer. So they checked uh, forty-two thousand about forty-two thousand children thyroid had, had a thyroid test, and, uh, and roughly like fifty percent of the children has got an abnormal thyroid something, what do you call that? Mm. Yeah. 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 yeah, something wrong. And uh, it, you know, some of them really serious already becomes cancer already. And, um, and not just the Fukushima actually. So quite wider area, children has got uh, lots of health problem, not just the thyroid problem. And just after the accident, so many children just breathing nose a lot. Like my, my friend, he's a teacher, and uh, he said uh, half of the children in, the, in his class breathing nose. At the same time? Uh, yeah, at the same time. Never happened. He, he, his experience as a teacher for nearly 30 years never happened before, first time. And uh, lots of places. And, uh, you know, just uh, also the immune system became low. So, they, are, they become tired really easily. So that is really a wide area, including Tokyo. So which means uh, more than 200 kilometer area. So most of the east of Japan, the children, especially children, not, not just the children, actually also the other, including adults, has got uh, health problem. And also like, uh, you know, actually, actually, more death, uh, death rate is get, go, rising up. And uh, like, uh, if you go to the, what is it, cremate, cremate, cremate? The place yeah, the, that- the, the, the cremation. Cremation, yeah. yeah. So you have to wait like one week, two weeks, which means so many people dying actually, including Tokyo. 
But of course, the government doesn't say anything. It's connecting to the radiation or anything. Or so we can't prove. Well, they they actually they don't just say uh, they don't they're not quiet on the subject. They actually vocally say there is no connection in every case. No. So the, the, the man who was in charge of the nuclear pl plant and the initial response, who made a very good call to use seawater to, as a coolant, which actually destroys an, the economic value of the plant, when all around him were panicking, actually took a, a decision of his own to, to use seawater and therefore made a huge difference to the, the progress of the, of the accident, has since died of cancer, of throat cancer, but they were categorically, even without an autopsy or, or an inquest, said there was no relationship between that cancer and, uh, and we, we'll never know. The point is that they're categorically sure, unscientifically sure, that in every case, whether it's to do with children's health or the death rate, um, uh, you know, people, if people suddenly drop dead who've been otherwise healthy, there is definitely no, no uh, connection. So, Does the cooling sea want to go back into the sea? Um, yeah, we, we'll, we'll come to that a, a little bit later, but yes, there's a, a huge problem with both, both dumping and leakage, really. Yeah, just, uh, just recently, I think two weeks ago, uh, Tep, Tep, Tepco, Tepco announced... Tep, Tep, Tepco is the company is that owned the Tokyo, plant. And Tokyo something, something, something. Tokyo Electric Power. Yeah, and uh, they just, uh, they, they kept saying, we, we are not sure how many... How, how much radiation released you know, to the sea. But just they admitted, um, I think, 20, 23 billion becquerel per litre or something like that. It's, we, can't, we can't imagine that just a lot. Mm. So they're just, uh, and uh, like fishermen, Fisherman's Association, they're really angry because the government and the tep TEPCO kept saying, the sea is safe, but yeah. actually not. Uh, I mean, we're looking at the situation now, and to move on to the state of the, the reactor, as you've mentioned it, um, you know, a state of, of cold shutdown was declared about a year ago. And that was very important politically for the Japanese government to do that. They rushed and pushed for that to happen. But cold shutdown is a, is a, a technical term that doesn't necessarily mean there's nothing happening in the plant. It certainly doesn't mean to say that everything's under control. Um, the, the coolant system, which is a, a basically a very temporary jerry-rigged system, is constantly at risk of breaking down. That's extremely serious, mainly because uh, not only that, the, that uh, three of the ra reactors melted down, that is, they breached their containment vessels and, and basically headed down into the earth. Nobody actually knows what's happening down there because there are no sensors and you can't monitor it. Have they admitted that yet? That's oh, yeah, that, that's officially yeah. recognised. Yeah, this is, yeah, this is officially recognised information as I understand it. So, um, you know, they're guessing really what's happening in terms of, you know, they're saying they don't think that um, you know that, that uh, a nuclear reaction is happening, but they actually know that. And there's currently very highly highly radioactive steam coming out of one that some commentators think is the uh, evidence of uh, of nuclear reaction occurring underground. So it's very uncertain. It's very unstable. The reason the coolant system is very important is because of the fuel storage ponds. So because the storage issue, as in the UK. Nobody wants nuclear storage in their back garden. And so they decided they would store um, a large quantity of used fuel rods upstairs in the nuclear, nuclear reactors. So perhaps you could, you, I think you know a little bit more about that issue, don't you? Uh, yeah, just, that is a, just a reactor for um, fuel rods. Do you say fuel rods? Fuel rods. Yeah. Fuel rods, yeah, is the same amount as 4,000 Hiroshima bombs, 4,000. So still, and still in the middle of the building, the building is nearly collapsing. So still earthquake is happening, like yesterday, still quite magnitude six earthquake happened yesterday and near, near Fukushima. So still 
earthquakes keep, keep happening, but the building is always really dangerous, sta still dangerous state. So if you f fall down the 1,500 volts, yeah, yeah. yeah fuel volts, yeah. we'll be disaster. Which would then be impossible to cool, of course, because they wouldn't be in a situation where you could contain any sort of coolant around them. Um, the, the, the issue with the sea and therefore fishing, and obviously it's a very important food source, um, that they are producing so much highly radio radioactive water that they're running out of places to store it. And, the, and again, the, they had to build those storage pools very quickly, so they're leaking into the ground, which is going into the groundwater ultimately and into the ocean. And um, the, this is one of the issues that, where the local economy in the event of a disaster, and would presumably be the same here in the event of a disaster at, at, at Hinkley, is that the local economy is essentially ruined in all its, all its aspects. So fishing is clearly not a viable um, industry when the sea is so highly polluted. Um, agriculture, nobody wants to buy your produce anymore. If you manage to find a way of selling your produce, you're doing that living with knowing that you're actually selling something that potentially, could potentially damage people's health. So the situation for agriculture, and obviously in this area of the country, it's a wonderful agriculture area with some fantastic produce, that would then become economically useless. So everybody's asking that same question. Is there is the information, we all need information, but is that information reliable? And in the situation uh, and in Japan, I think it would probably be the same here. You're going to get drastically different information from different sources. The government and the government official scientists and academics will tell you one thing. Independent academics and independent scientists might tell you, some, tell you something completely different. NGOs and, and voluntary groups might tell you something different again who are doing testing on the ground. Um, the web community will, tell, will be sharing information that may be slightly different again or the emphasis might be different. It's very, very confusing to know what's uh, accurate to understand and you have to educate yourself fast as we did. I don't think, although we you know, were aware of the, of the subject in a general sense as anybody would be, um, you have to give yourself a crash course in radiation levels, risk, if you start even looking at things to do with the structure of plants, I mean, what you can do with that information, I don't know, but you're just desperately looking for something to help you decide what to do. So you can see this is Fukushima. And the reactor is, a, no, just a straight one. <laughs> it's about, yeah, here. Yeah. Fukushima, here. Yeah. And uh, our village is about, is it here, isn't it? Right. Yeah, mm. here. That's about 115 kilometers. No, uh, about 130, 130 kilometers. Yeah. yeah. And the evacuation, the government made evac evac evacuation areas on red zones of 20 kilometers. But the circle, but obviously the radiation is not going to the circle. So yeah. plume is going to actually went to this way. Mm. Really high contamination area is this way. So e even here, it's really high contamination, contaminated mm. down, you know, here. So the but government decided circle. So it's not practical at all. So pe pe actually people evacuated on uh, when the when the reactor uh, at the plant, uh, new nuclear power plant, explode, government suggested to evacuate to this way as well. So not so many people you know, ran away to here. But actually, that co that village called Idate Idate village is really really high radiation. Mm. Plume came. The prevailing wind. Yeah, because wind came. So that America knew that. Yeah. And also, it called Speedy. Japanese government may put the tons of money, billions of money, to, to make a like, search for the plume which, which is going. But actually, when the, when the accident happened, Japanese government 
hid, he hid the information, so people didn't know which is, which is going to the plume. Actually, it's going to that way, and uh, also that way, and like, you know, all, all dif different way of one is going that way, and one is going that way. The Tokyo is here, about here. So that's uh, like, you know, and also that, that way as well, on the north as well, so e every day, different yeah. direction. Yeah. I mean, in, in, a, in a general sense, I mean, the important point um, for this area and for, for anybody in the UK or anybody that lives near a nuclear plant is the number one information that you need and the most useful thing to us is that um, radiation weather modelling prediction map. And it's an animated, an animated map based on uh, sophisticated weather models. It doesn't tell you exactly what the radiation levels would be, but it gives you an indication about whether it's coming your way that day. And so, for example, if you have children, and, you, and uh, we used, this was a daily thing for us, we'd, we'd check the German site because the Japanese government had the information but didn't use it. I think that would be exactly the same in the UK. They would not want you to have that information because they don't want people making their own decisions. They want to manage where people go. And one of the main issues, of, of course, is you would think, well, why wouldn't they evacuate everybody just in case? Anybody like to have a guess about why the Japanese government only evacuated a very small area, even though it was clear from the model that the plume was going over a, a long area? Exactly, cost. Well, yeah. It's extremely expensive. So, for example, do you imagine that the UK government would evacuate Bristol? <laughs> you have to imagine the cost of, you know, logistics of actually doing it in the first place. And then the cost of compensating people if they couldn't go back afterwards. They can yeah. also maintain the pretense that it isn't as bad as it really is by not evacuating people. That, that's correct, yeah. The, the, the message is to be massaged that it's safe, don't worry, there's no immediate danger, which was, it sounds like almost a cliche. You'd sort of think, well, you can't say that because nobody would believe it. But over and over again, they're saying there's no immediate danger. And of course, a lot of the danger is somewhere down the line. That's one of the issues. But anyway, uh, if there, there, we, we talked about this before and we thought, well, um, you know, what are the, some of the two key things you need to do that uh, people in this area should do? One of them is to push for, that, for having that weather modelling map available. So the British government has that information. We do have monitoring posts that, that the monitor. We do have scientists that are capable of doing that. We model, we model weather all the time. We need the BBC or somebody to do it, the meteorological office, to do it and needs to be available. The other thing is you need iodine tablets available. The reason that nearly 50% of children in Fukushima have got thyroid abnormalities is because thyroid was, uh, is because iodine wasn't given to them. It wasn't available. Yeah. And they weren't, you know, and, and it wasn't, there was not a system for making sure they took it because, you know, that's an immediate risk to children. And of course, there are, there are longer term risks. Uh, yeah, I think Japanese people trust you know, news or I, I, don't, I don't think uh, they doubt much about television <laughs> that Japanese people do and also they don't want to be in a panic. Um, so that is, I think, a Japanese character and uh, uh, it's, it's a slightly different subject. But actually, when we, when we decided to leave Fukushima on... Uh, is it three days later, after 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 the earthquake, and we, you know, pe people don't didn't have a petrol much, but we are lucky to get to the the airport because all roads closed, mm. may may motorways closed, and uh, just to, we we could have get to the it, the it called Niigata Airport, which means the west side of. Uh, like Japan Sea, and uh, when we got to the airport, so many people were there, and uh, to to lead, to to evacuate it to the to the west of Japan, but on the television still keep they kept saying so that really strange gap wasn't it? So mm. 
because of if you get the information, like we are lucky because of we, we, our friends' friends actually worked in the reactor too on that time. And he sent the message to the, the two friends, just leave east, east, east side of Fukushima. So we could get the information. Also, we saw the explorer is not right things to stay in Fukushima. But if you don't get the information, that kind of things, just the, you don't know. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's, the, that's really important, the, the, the sharing, kind of, sharing information. Is, yeah. it, mm. Very important. So we, we talk to people uh, to the, our village, and I talk, I talk to, the, the, to the school. To, to ask to get the school bus to put the kids in and to to drive to the west of Japan and I talk to the mayor but they, they can't because government doesn't do anything they kept saying safe so they were waiting from, for orders from above yeah. and there, Japan is uh, I mean the UK is too Our institutions yeah, tend to be hierarchical and in Japan perhaps a little more so so everybody's always waiting for orders and the orders never came. Um, <clears throat> and there's not a tradition of acting individually so much. It tends to be more to do with reaching a consensus and a group harmony, and then eventually you all seem to seem to agree. And then it's quite a slow, uh, quite a slow process. And of, of course, you know that can be a wonderful thing in, in many ways, but it's not very quick. Uh, and in the event, the village we were in, one of the issues that made us leave was the fact that it was clear that the authorities were not going to take it seriously. They weren't set up to respond quickly. Um, so, you know, that kind of cooperation can be, you know, I mean, we love the community and it was a very beautiful uh, experience living in Fukushima, you know, fantastic people. Um, but in, it, at the time of the, of the disaster, the institutions let people down. And um, so you had to make your own decision. And, uh, initially, uh, I think the nation was in denial and shock. And when we we evacuated, ironically, to Hiroshima, and it was as if nothing was happening in Hiroshima. It was like as if, uh, you know, we were in a, we were dazed uh, and confused from what what was happening in the north. And there, people hadn't even realised it. it. Might have been a bit like something happening in southern Italy for us, perhaps. Um, and it was very, very painful to see that it wasn't real to people. And um, we spent time trying to get the local authorities in Hiroshima to respond, and they wouldn't. You say, that's quite strange, isn't it? But they, they wouldn't because, again, they wanted to defer to central government, and they didn't be, want to be the, the mayor of Hiroshima, didn't want to be uh, the person who was uh, saying to Khan, the prime minister, you must evacuate more children, even though... Hiroshima, with its history, you would think be in a, a great position to do that. So those are some of the symptoms of that kind of, you know, in some ways very work, workable, cooperative, uh, but hierarchical approach, and and it, it's found wanting in times of emergency. But if we could perhaps think about protest, because that it, things have changed quite a bit. Initially, there was a massive wave of volunteering, so tremendous numbers of people going to tsunami areas and right near the nuclear plant as well, just outside the evacuation zone, including myself and locals from our area, we went to try and help with the tsunami clear-up. Although we didn't actually get information, found out later there was strontium in the... Like I was digging in a riverbed, we found out later there was strontium in that area. We didn't have that information. But, you know, it was tremendous that people were volunteering. Not a lot of initial protests, but then uh, mainly led by the mothers in Fukushima, I think, to begin with. And perhaps, Miss, you could explain how the protest movement um, developed. Yeah, uh, because uh, the the government kept saying uh, lying, and uh, about like, normally, like two months later or three months later, actually happened. Like uh, melting melt down. Government kept saying the reactor didn't melt down. They kept saying, but two two three months later, actually, actually two reactors melt down. They admitted and, that it was, Yeah, admitted. Yeah. And always, like, uh, later, and actually on the time, like, Twitter or, like, social network or blog, they kept saying it could be blah, 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 you know. But it, 
you know, governments, it's a lie, don't trust. But two, three months later, they admit it. So they, they, they repeating. So mothers started to think our children are safe or not. So they start, so individually or group, they, they started to think, is it safe to give a food to children? What is safe or what is not safe? And also the situation, because of so many children have got to, something like breathe, breathing, no, breathing nose or something wrong. So mainly mom, mo mothers started to action a lot to the first, uh, first talk, to the, talk to the council or school, but uh, really difficult to they understand because they, they trust the gov government. So it's getting increasing, increasing. And also the tweet, especially Twitters, or not just the Twitters, but also the you know, talking to the friends or something like that. And uh, it's getting people started to think we don't we don't need a, we don't need a, um, nuclear power station anymore. We need real information to protect children. So that is a, it, Japanese people's attitude. Has, it's in changing last last two years. They actually picketed outside TEPCO's office and outside government ministers' office. They were treated quite roughly as, uh, to begin with. They found it very difficult. Um, but stage protests and sit-in protests in Tokyo. And I think that, in a way, was a spark. And it's, other yeah. people started organising around that because that was very potent to see the mothers and their children there and being, treated, being sort of roughly handled by security guards outside, outside Parliament. And um, it went on to kind of radicalise a generation of, well, actually all generations. Um, the last time there was any sort of, uh, uh, sort of a tradition of protest in Japan was probably in the early 70s, the student movement. Yes, yeah, yeah. Student. so not not until the 70s, and that was really more a, a kind of Just a student a movement, a student protest movement in the cities. This has actually um, made all generations in all areas of Japan turn up on marches that never would have dreamt of doing it before. No. So, um, but it's not reported in Japan. It doesn't exist in Japan. Uh, everybody kind of knows because they see it in their cities and their towns and they may join in, but it's not on the equivalent of the BBC. I'd just like to come back to this issue of information because it is so key and to think about the UK. And I've been quite sort of had to think very clearly because this is my home country and I obviously care about it a lot. And I thought, well, is there something unique in Japan that would made it made the response so inadequate and to, the, the flow of information so poor? What would it be like here? And sadly, my own personal view is it would not be any better here. And there is some evidence for that. I think the BBC has been fairly moved on from the Fukushima issue fairly quickly. Most of the national media don't actually cover it in depth in comparison to, say, the New York Times. And I've been trying to sort of follow and see where the best sources were. And to be honest, the, the British media are fairly poor. And I would say most of the media are, are uh, uh, editorially, at least, pro-nuclear, although they will publish some critical um, issues. Um, but the particularly concerning thing is the relationship between... Uh, and, you know, the Japanese model, I think, is maybe a little bit uh, similar to the British model in that... Um, that you have you have uh, media regulatory bodies, government, industry, and lobbyists, which are fairly um, uh, entangled. In, you know, it'll be a different way in different cases, but they're fairly entangled. One piece of evidence that came out that the Guardian reported were some fairly damning emails that had been sent that showed collusion between the nuclear industry and the ministry responsible in Britain talking about how it should be handled, how should the Fukushima issue be handled. And they said that the key thing is, the, message to, the key message to be online, on message as it were, is that this is not like Chernobyl. It's important to emphasize, emphasize that Fukushima is not like Chernobyl. That's proved not to be the case because official TEPCO and government Japanese figures have shown that actually greater amounts of radiation have been released. But even more worrying than that, um, and this may simply be a coincidence, but the, the, the chief government scientist was on the BBC within a day or two of, of the disaster saying exactly that. The important thing to remember is that this is not Chernobyl. This is not comparable with Chernobyl. 
Now that really concerns me, it may be a coincidence, but I don't see a very lively debate in Britain. And in view of the fact that the government is currently negotiating a very high, uh, as it's called, strike price for um, nuclear generated electricity with a French nationalised company, EDF, which will guarantee them a profit into the future without any liability to pay for the massive costs that happen. In the event of a disaster, they can effectively, after a few million, wash their hands of it. That's true of the nuclear industry across, across Britain. There is no insurance in the nuclear industry. It, so it's very concerning that, that uh, that's happening in Britain. I don't, I don't actually trust that we would get a better flow of information. So I would say it's really important that you, you, know, you talk uh, amongst the people you know and, and your network of friends and say, well, in this area, what we really need is this and campaign specifically for that because you probably will not get it elsewhere. So uh, I think that in international safe level is one millisievert per year is a limit. So it's safe to live for human being. But after, after, after the accident, government has deci decided 20 millisievert for children. So which means they don't have to pay to, eva to people evacuate. So 20 millisievert. 20 millisievert is more than actual, actual workers in the nuclear power station. And actually the responsibility, the person who responsibility, he, he left because he, um, he, he cried. I can't, he said, I can't give 20 millisievert to children. And he left. So, but the government hasn't changed. Still going on 20 millisievert. Well, they have to change it back. They did a lot uh, later, didn't they? No, but, but still, no, uh, no, still, still, that, that year, so it's a three, three point something micro sieverts per an hour, still, still going on, in, the inside of Fukushima, yeah, it's safe. The same safety levels as workers at a nuclear reactor for children. Yeah, yeah more, I, I think that is 50, 50 milli sievert for one year and 100 milli sievert for five years, inside five years. So not really different from the actual workers. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and also the food, about food, food safety. Um, government uh, sta made the standard safety levels. Was, uh, it called ID and cesium, just the two, two kind of uh, radiation. Actually, two, more than 200 kind of radiation exist, if, exist in the spread. In, in, in Japan, but only two, two things. And the first was 2,000 milli... Uh, I don't know if it, you understand, but the 2,000 milli sievert for iodine and the 500 milli sievert for cesium. But actually, before the accident, when, uh, what is it, the nuclear waste, if more than 100 milli sievert is going to be in a tank, to put the radiation mark, to put in a separate place. That's 100 millisievert. But actually, government set the standard level is 500 millisievert. But last year, last spring, they, they, they put the lower 100 millisievert. Still now, the 100 millisievert, up to 100 millisievert can go to the market. So the children eat in the similar, you know, if it was 99.9 .9 millisievert. And the Becquerel, sorry, be Becquerel, sorry, Becquerel. So previously sorry. it would have been classified as dangerous waste, and now yeah. you can eat it. So it that's allowed in the food yeah. allowed to sell. Yeah, so, so that's also the, you know, we are really worried. So I, I talk to the council or, you know, school dinner, because Japanese school has to eat school dinner, not allowed to, have a, to take pack, pack lunch. So... The schools should be checked, not not high high like that, high, high 100 milli, uh, by 100 uh, becquerels per kilogram. Um, so that's reason the government monitoring, but just picking up a little bit, little bit. That's not it. Does not work because that one is might not. So. Um,
say. I mean, if we can give an example of um, the way that people have been radicalised, there was, there was an actor uh, called Yama, Yamamoto, Yamamoto Taro. Yeah, Yamamoto Taro. He was, if anybody's um, seen the Japanese film that came out, uh, what was the film he was called? In, you know, the, uh, it's not, it's not. Anyway, some, anyway he was in a film that was shown widely around the world. So he's, you know, a fairly high profile actor and was a very visible face on Japanese television. And I think he happened to say somewhere, not particularly high pro profile place, and certainly not in the course of his work, he said that he was anti-nuclear. He wasn't particularly virulent about it, he just said he was anti-nuclear. He lost all of his work immediately. He had to resign from his work because the sponsors um, of the television By companies Toshiba. were, were all connected yeah. to the nuclear industry. Hitachi, Toshiba, Toshiba yeah. the electricity companies and so on, they have a, a very big budget. Now he has since become a political figure and he's just been elected to the Diet as a member of parliament, as an independent. And uh, a slightly kind of ludicrous comic aside was that he ha actually uh, got a huge crowd in an election where crowds have been absent because people are so disgusted with politicians in general and the, the way they've responded. He got a huge crowd. But um, the equivalent of The Guardian, the Asahi Shimbun, and various other news outlets used a photo of his crowd without saying it was his crowd and said that the mainstream parties had been speaking on the street. Yeah, that's amazing. And it just makes you laugh if you kind of know the story, but it's, it kind of makes you laugh and makes you cry at the same time. But he's a, you know, he's a case of somebody that's, that's actually begun as probably not a particularly political person. He was a celebrity actor. Um, it's a bit like, you know, somebody like Robbie Williams or somebody some, suddenly becoming, you know, and that's the effect that it's, it's had on, on yeah, society. He's, he's actually saying to, you know, Fukushima children need to evacuate. Mm -hmm. So they are under the threat to mm -hmm. expose to the radiation. He, he said on the television and suddenly cut and go, going to the ad, 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 advertisement mm -hmm. <laughs> straight away when, they, when he talked. Yeah, that, he'd, he'd arranged television yeah. time and clearly they'd agreed, probably had agreed a subject when as soon as he began to talk about radiation, she was cut and then all these other slots were lost. Yeah. So it gives you... The Japanese government is actually trying to uh, restart the nuclear program. As you're perhaps aware, all of the nuclear uh, plants were closed down to have safety checks and what they call stress tests. And the, uh, and the kind of a new, slightly more independent safety body has been set up. The safety body has actually been saying you shouldn't restart these plants because they're active faults. Um, but the current government, which is the, the uh, Conservative Party within power for, for the 50 years after the war that actually established the nuclear programme, have now very strangely got back into power again and want to restart the nuclear programme. So you have one half of Japanese society um, completely at loggerheads over the, over the nuclear issue. So... Sure. What percentage no, is nuclear? The, be, before, before the accident, 30, 30 nearly, nearly 30 per, percent. Mm. Yes, but uh, now it's only two reactors are working in 54. So just the, it called the Kansai area has got the two reactors mm. is working, but rest of the rest of the reactors, not the, yeah, they are not working now. But the government wants to restart. But actually, we. You know, Japanese summer is really, really hot, and uh, so we need uh, air conditioner. So in summer, we need uh, lots of electricity. But uh, we, 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 we were okay for two, you know, two, two, two summers. summers already. We passed it. Mm -hmm. So people started to say, we don't need nuclear power. Mm -hmm. So where is it in the electricity coming from? It's very, various, various, diff uh, not many renewable, I think a small amount of a percentage. So hydroelectric is quite strong. Isn't yeah. Geothermal. The, the no, sun. Yeah, sun. small. Yeah. The small. They've increased. They have. They have increased their uh, purchase. The governments of the country has increased its purchasing of gas and coal. But is it? Sorry. In Portugal. 
Yeah, imported because they don't they don't have any of their, much of their own. Yeah. And some 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 companies started to give up more budget for the solar mega solar. Mm. And if if you're in the compulsory government re uh, recognised evacuation zone, yeah. then you will get compensated. Yeah. Uh, about uh, seven hundred pounds per month or something, I think. Mm. Yeah. Um, I think it's fair yeah. to say that it's, it's not, not, enough not enough to to no. replace everything that you've lost. You know, your in, your entire so kind of. That's a sort of pension rather than a bulk amount of compensation for the value of your house. What form does it come in the compensation? Compensation, just uh, um, I think, just uh, you know, twenty twenty kilometer zone. Yeah. They, I think they got. Uh, they got a lump sum. In yeah, one, some, one, yeah. Money, but not enough money to buy no. house in a different place. Not enough money, and just uh, every month that's uh, seven hundred pounds a month. Mm -hmm. Just they get, and the rest of the people just uh, the, we we can't get any compensation, anything. Also including companies. So some companies or some council. What is called to the went to the court? Yeah, going to court, court. to try and get compensation yeah, because get of their enormous damage. costs. You imagine your well, no, no just green, yeah, yeah damages to the business them. or mm. yeah, there are, there are huge costs associated for everybody in the community, and the impact on councils. Councils are stretched to breaking point. All of their services are stretched, and they're asked sometimes asked and sometimes told to do things by government that they don't, don't really have the money to do. And then they try and recoup that money later from central government. Don't always succeed. And clean up is one of those issues. And and what what the Japanese government, the, the precedent they've set, which it, you know the, the UK government could potentially follow, is you you minimise the evacuation zone and therefore minimise the um, the compensation cost. You argue that it's safe out everywhere outside those areas. Therefore, you don't need to compensate people. That is one of the pressures towards making things categorically safe. <clears throat> and um, that means that you keep a huge amount of people in place, as many people in place as you can, and then you argue all the way along the line that it's not related and, and not related, uh, and you minimise the, the, the compensation that way. And I think that would, you know, it, it's likely that that would... That would also happen here, and then you it generates in the, amongst councils and the community and businesses a whole plethora of court cases which will drag on for years and years, because you know businesses aren't happy if their entire business model has collapsed and their 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 plant is contaminated and nobody will buy their products because it's associated with that place. Um, you know, there's you know as we've seen, you know, if you if you're able to spare a little for the. <clears throat> the young people that are going are taking Fukushima to court to try and get uh, relocated in a safe place. If we look at the um, health issues as well, further down the line, there'll be uh, so you get this whole raft of things, and it all stems, if you like, in the beginning from that cost-saving exercise of minimising compensation, from which the safety, the idea of absolute safety, the myth of safety then goes and then science has to follow that and there's all sorts of pressure for everything to follow that. So you can see the kind of pattern as it spreads out down the years really. In the meantime, what's actually happening on the ground might be rather different and sometimes you don't know for quite some time. I mean, if yeah. we could just come back on this issue to the workers, because thousands of people have now worked on trying to control the situation at Fukushima Daiichi. And the system is that um, the best paid um, professional nuclear workers work for TEPCO. They, they have some monitoring and, and uh, the, their work, work pattern and their exposure is controlled a little. But most of the work, the vast majority of the work, including some of the very dangerous work, gets done by sub um, the, employ the temporary casual labour sub subcontractors. So, and by the time you get down to that level, you're not even being paid very much. But people kind of feel a sense of, you know, some of the, you know, the, so you get the, the typical urban 
urban poor who have no choice, and that's the only word that's available, they'll do it. And they're kind of fatalistic, some of them idealistic and wanting to make a contribution, some of them fatalistic and thinking, well, that's the only work I can get. Those people have no follow-up at all. So they, th you know, everybody has monitoring and has, they're supposed, in theory, there's a, a limit to the work you can do. But in fact, it's not very carefully controlled the further down that chain you are. Um. Well, I mean, an example of, of how that happened in the early days, as, a, as if it's sort of a paradigm of what ha might happen, is, as Mitska was saying, that you, you had, for example, Greenpeace went in monitoring when the government was saying, you know, there's no risk, it's a minor incident, uh, and that was being spread around the world. It's a fairly minor incident, it's not a Chernobyl. And Greenpeace went in and said, no, wait a minute, these are in very, very high levels. The government said that's not true. It proved to be the case. Now, there are individual, as I said, individual um, academics and scientists and medical people trying to do their own testing, but they're doing it on small budgets, often uh, in a very independent way, because many of the universities and uh, institutions won't employ them if they're doing something that's too directly seen as being part of the, the political process of nuclear. No. The, the, the World Health Organization, anything they say about radiation has to be checked by the International Atomic Energy Authority, which is a set up to propagate, promote the safe use of nuclear power, but all albeit, but the, the, it's to promote the, the use of nuclear power. So there is no, it's hard to see any of the, the sort of larger organisations yeah. as being entirely independent. Yeah, but some university professor actually checked the contamination and uh, they made, made a map for so, so some, some profes, professors do individually. Yeah. Also, I think the group with the Japan, Japanese, Japan, I think some Chubu University with the American, some mm -hmm. institute together, they're, they're actually researching. And we can see on the internet the result. And that result is different from the Japanese government <laughs> official report. Mm -hmm. actually. Uh positive thing about the UK is we haven't had a, a, a disaster on the, on the scale of Chernobyl or Fukushima yet, so we do have time to actually think, is this the route we want to go down? The government is currently um, hoping to commission new nuclear bill, but it hasn't happened yet, so we do have time. That, that is a positive thing. The other lesson um, that we've seen, we, we've seen from Germany and various other countries, that governments can actually decide to do something different. Um, we need to continue to protect... Uh, Press that that happens. But Japan has some quite interesting lessons in that respect, in that, um, you know, partly because of the, the ethos of group cooperation, when it came to it, the, the, the power company was saying, we need nuclear power stations because otherwise there will be power cuts and the country will grind to a halt. And of course, we, you know, we're beginning to hear that here. That actually didn't happen because people decided they would rather use less electricity. Now, that's quite difficult in England because it's not real to us. The threat is not real to us. So people think, well, yeah, but I want to, you know, charge my mobile phone and, you know, or my hybrid vehicle or whatever it is, you know, um, to use all my white goods at home, to have the, the heating on, all the different things that we use electricity for. But actually, when it comes to the crunch and you can, people can see communally a sufficient reason to do it, they can do that as a collective decision. It was incredible in Japan. If you'd seen Japan before, which is the most technologically advanced country in the world. If you go around the shopping centres, it's just a babble of electronic goods, blaring lights. It's, you know, they're probably the most, you know, the, the, the amount of electricity uh, used per person is probably second only to America. And yet that country that you never would have predicted could do it actually decided to use so much less electricity, there weren't really any, any serious power cuts. And industry were involved with that, it was regulated, so industry was rationed, but the whole system didn't come falling down when that happened. Personally, I think that's a very positive thing because, you know, for our future, regardless of what the source is, there has to be a limit about what we consume, regardless of the argument about how you generate it. There must be a point at which we say, well, we're not all of us in the world, you know, the population of China, India and so on, going to be able to use limitless electricity. Japan has a very positive message there. Um, that people can act collectively to do that. I think that's quite an important 
things that have come out of Japan. What do you think the most useful thing is for people outside to help? Yeah, I, I have a lot of friends, Ibaki's friends also. My friends and family still live in Fukushima. And uh, they want English people give give a pressure to Japanese government. That's really, really important because the Japanese government is very you know, closed. So, But very weak, weak, weak against the foreign countries' pre pressure. So that's really important. So we expect that, you know, we expect English people care about Fukushima also. That's really appreciated. Give a pressure to Japanese government. That's really helpful. Just, just to say then, yeah, thanks very much indeed for coming again. And I hope um, we've given you some food for thought and things you might, you know, share a little bit more widely in the area because we're very keen that, you know, that our experience should help people live here, think through what they, you know, what they're going to do and what they're going to press for. Um, thank you for and uh, thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs>